Welcome to the complete collection of Charles Barkley's greatest stories. First and foremost, I want to thank everybody for all the support so far. This is a new episode, a fresh episode, and a long episode. Thank you to all of those who commented on the last episode and said that you wanted to see Charles Barkley. Here are a few comments on the last episode, and to be featured on the next episode, comment down below which player you would like to see next. If you have been enjoying this series, it would really mean a lot to me if you could quickly hit that like button, it takes two seconds, and it really does help get the videos out there. If you are new and you want to stay up to date with all the new episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button and hit that notification button so you never miss an episode in this series. If you have missed any of the previous episodes, there is a playlist link in the description box down below and on the screen right now. And lastly, I do want to apologize for not uploading as frequently as I would have liked, I just completed mid-semester college exams, but now the videos are back up and running, and to make up for it, I thought I would make a 30-minute Netflix-type special for all of you guys to enjoy. So get your popcorn, sit back, relax, and welcome to Charles Barkley's greatest stories. Look at him, how can you not love him? <laughs> No, okay, ball, I got ball, one. Go ahead, ball, ball, finish, ball, finish ball. killing us. Ball. A real fighter throws the first punch. I'm not going to walk up to you and let y'all slug me in my jaw first. I got to get y'all first. The cast of characters, the different personalities than Charles Barkley. Uh, but, um, and he's like, where you want to go? You want to go to bar? And I was like, what? And I had all this free time on my hand, and I hung out with Charles, and they had to get rid of both of us in Philadelphia. But give me an example, Charles, what you would say. What, what, what one of the guys was no, saying? No, what you would say. When you talk to I'll friend. tell you what he oh, said. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm playing him in uh, Washington. And, uh... If the ball was in the middle of five guys, everybody knew who would always come up with that ball. It was Charles Barkley. And not only grab it, but explode up. Still fighting for it. Go. Look at him go. <laughs> we had a lot. We were doing shots and everything. Was that the only time you played while intoxicated? No. No. <laughs> you know, everybody that has ever been in front of a camera, we tend to not say certain things. Why don't they just take their ass whipping like people and go home? <laughs> Barkley says things that we would think about and never say. Charles told us, matter of fact, we're going to go home, we're going to end this, sweep them, and go home and rest. And he told Paul, give me the ball. It was an but, even worse but, poster. Hey, but I got to tell you, the first time he's on me was in college. I'm like, this little fella, who's this little fat guy? He can't play. He's running away. Barkley with a great anticipation. Look at the big guy move. Big guy on the ball. But when I first saw Charles, I looked at this, I said, it's this big guy. This big guy can't play. And he dunked him. And I looked at this guy like, how can this big guy put all this weight in the air? He goes up, boom. I'm like, hey, he's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> In the, in the Georgia That's Auburn, what, oh, the Georgia he, Auburn hey, ride. America is either A, get dunked on, B, get a finger or arm broken, or a smile on, on camera. That's it. My agent says, hey, you know, we need to talk about this sub second situation. I said, what's the situation? He says, you know, they have a hard cap in the NBA, and you're going to have to get, like, the, the minimum, one year, $75,000. I said, I didn't leave college for $75,000. I, I think you weighed uh, 284 pounds before the 76ers drafted you. And they, Close they wanted, to 300. Okay, and they, they wanted you to, to at least I, I heard, get down to 275 before the draft. You end up getting down to 272 pounds, and then what happens? So I said, well, we got to make sure the Sixers don't draft me now. So we went on a two-day eating binge. We got up the first morning. I had like six pancakes bacon, wash it down with a vanilla shake. <laughs> then we went to lunch. I, I think I had like uh, four or five pieces of Kentucky Fried Chicken, some mashed potatoes, some coleslaw. Then we went to dinner someplace. I had like a T-bone steak, had a baked potato. Uh, and then next day did the exact same thing. So we fly to Philly. I get on a scale. I'm like 302. <laughs> I like 302. And Harold Cast cursed me. You That's the fat, owner of the yeah, 70s. You fat, lazy, blah, blah, blah. 
get, just get out of here. Get out of here. And we take the train up to New York. And I got to tell you something. I, 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 if people take a good look at the uh, tape, and when they said with the number five pick, the 76ers take Charles Barkley, the look on my face is, are you kidding me? You weren't smiling. I like, wasn't smiling because yeah. I was like, I left college for $75,000. In the 1984 draft, Philadelphia selected him number five. The Philadelphia 76ers select Charles Barkley of Auburn University. Initially, I wasn't that excited. You're talking about someone under 6'5", playing a power forward position in the NBA. And I remember telling my agent, I said, oh my God. But in fairness to the Sixers, they end up trading two guys. Uh, they traded two guys, and my first contract was four years, $2 million. Uh, so uh, I'm off and running then. Charles' first year was quite an experience. Charles would um, act up. Charles wouldn't run back to half court. Charles, Charles was very difficult, to say the least. When I walked in that locker room the first day, it, I, I was on cloud nine. But also, I couldn't decide, should I call him Dr. J, Mr. Irving, or what? And now he made it easy for me. He came up to me the first day and said, hey, I'm Doc. And that was it. With Moses and myself, I mean, I think he really looked up to us because we were already established. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that most people don't say, the, the biggest influence in my basketball career has been Moses Malone. And I pulled Moses aside, and I said, Moses, why am I not getting to play? And Moses, you know, he, he's really brutal. He said, you fat and you lazy, young fellow. You fat and you lazy. I'm like, oh, I'm fat and I'm lazy. He said, you need to lose some weight. He says, you want to work hard, I'll help you. Big, big Mo, Big Mo, Big Mo, I'll help you. You, you could see that Charles wanted to be great, but he didn't want to work at it. So I said, Charles, you know, things you got to do, it's not going to come easy because right now you're into pro ball, you got a lot of great athletes. I said, what you got to do, get the attitude and get mean and get aggressive and come play every night. And uh, he was great. And I think at that time I was like 290. He says, I want you to lose 10 pounds. So I lose 10 pounds, I'm 280. He said, I want you to get to 270 now. I get to 270, and now I'm like, okay, I'm in, you can tell I'm in shape now, and I'm getting to play. He says, get to 260. At this point, I'm starting to like, really start to kick some butt. I'm starting to play well. He can play, obviously, extended periods of time. And he says, why don't you get to 250? I'm really rolling right now. And then I get to, he said, get to 240. He said, I want to experiment. I got to 240, but I didn't feel strong and explosive. He says, no, 250, 250 is your weight. And that's what I played my entire career at. And it was a lot of yes, sir, no, sir, whatever. It, it quickly changed from get out my way. Right. <laughs> Move, bitch, get out the way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, uh, yeah, yeah, he, um, he does recall and recount uh, those years uh, that we played together. And we had a lot of fun. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. And, and watching him uh, develop and watching him become a dominant force was, was a joy. Your former teammate, this caught my attention, I have to ask you about it. Uh, Jason Williams told Vice Sports a story about you showing up to practice, eating McDonald's breakfast while exercising on the bike and yelling at your teammates. Is that the truth? What is the truth behind that story? Charles Barkley took me under his wing, which I wish he didn't. I remember going to my first practice with uh, Charles Barkley, who didn't practice, who never practiced. In two years, he practiced twice. He used to come in Brad, and get on the stationary bike and ride one mile an hour, and he'll take McDonald's, and he'll take uh, 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 the hot cakes and sausage and the butter and the syrup and put it in a, like a tortilla and squish it, and all be coming out. It looks so good, especially when you're hung over. And he'd be eating it, and he'd be like, y'all run the floor. And he'd be pedaling one mile out, and we'd be running up and down practice, and he'd just sitting on the side. That's why we ain't gonna never be shit, because you guys don't run the floor. Man, practice harder. That let the pancakes be spitting out. That's the truth. You know, when I got to Philadelphia, Dr. J, Moses Malone, Maurice Cheeks, they never practice. They sit on the side, on the stationary bike, eating McDonald's. So <laughs> once I had been in the league X amount of years, 
I adopted that philosophy. I had played 48 minutes the night before. I wasn't going to get up the next morning to go to practice. <laughs> and I always go with the uh, egg McMuffins and the hot cakes and sausage, too. That's the best breakfast you can get. And you wrap it up together. That's what he said, right? Oh, oh yeah. And then after practice, I'm dead tired. And I say, well, man, oh, what do we do now? Oh, we got to go. And I'm thinking, like, study hall or something. You go, that's it, man. Two hours. we see you tomorrow. I'm like, that's all? And he's like, where you want to go? You want to go to the bar? And I was like, what? And I had all this free time on my hand, and I hung out with Charles, and they had to get rid of both of us in Philadelphia. You told Jimmy Kimmel last night that you once played the game intoxicated because you'd been celebrating the trade to the Lakers that had fallen apart. Do you remember the game subsequent to that? What happened? How'd that go? Because I can't remember it. The Lakers are the biggest here. Is it true you almost played for the Lakers? You were almost yeah, sent you know, to the I Lakers? Yeah, you know, I got traded to the Lakers. Uh, so I get a call from my agent one morning. It was one of my last uh, years in Philly. I got a call from my agent first thing in the morning. He says, we think the, the Sixers and the Lakers have a deal. And he says, uh, I think we got a deal. You're going to the Lakers. So me and two of my boys, this is about 11.30 during the day. And what year is this? Uh, I want to say 90, 90, somewhere, in the late 80s. So you're in 80s. Philly? Yeah. OK. And I was so excited. And he says, uh, I said, the deal done? He says, yes, the deal is done. So me and my boys went out to celebrate. We started getting drunk in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was so excited. And then about three hours later, I get a call from my agent said the Sixers backed out of the deal. <laughs> my agent calls me back about three hours later. He said, the Sixers pull out the deal. And we got a game that night. <laughs> I, I don't remember anything about that game. <laughs> and, Mike, I tell you what, I never, I have never drank before a game before, but that's the only time I've ever did it in my life. I don't even remember the game. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I played good or bad or who we played. It was, it was in Philly, and it was before the year I got traded. Dog. Did you hit double figures that night? I don't remember. He once played the game intoxicated. It was one of my last uh, years in Philly. It was, it was in Philly, and it was before the year I got traded. I get a call from my agent, and he says, uh, I think we got a deal. You're going to the Lakers. First of all, I was so pissed, uh -huh. but I was so drunk, too. <laughs> I, I have no idea what happened that game. You know, know your stats? Did you? Uh, I do not even remember the game, actually. Oh, like, I can remember a lot of games I played, but that day, we were so excited. I was getting out of Philadelphia, and I was blasted. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Hey, yeah. some of them teams I played on, I needed to drink. Oh, my goodness. I was playing with some bombs in Philly. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, Charles was the, was the, was the kind of player that... You know, he, he just exude confidence. You know, he knew he was a good player, and, and he demonstrated that every night. And, I, you know, there are a couple of, you know, true story is, you know, we're playing against the, uh, we're playing against the Detroit Pistons, and, you know, they have Isaiah and Joe Dumars, and this is when Dennis Rodman was on the Pistons as well. And, you know, they have Bam, Bill Lambeer, and I just... Oh, I have an awful first half. I feel like I'm scoreless. I have zero points. I'm all seven from the field, and I'm just playing awful. And coming out the second half, Charles Liddy grabs me by my collar, by my jersey, and grabs me sort of close to him. And then, you know, I can't say exactly what he says, but it's more like, you know, get your crap together. You know, you're too good to be you know, scoring zero points and, you know, out there playing like, you know, so I'm like, holy crap, you know, what, what's going on? And, you know, that alone to say, you know, I had a, a great second half, but, you know, but he, he had faith in me and the confidence that, you know, he knew he was the number one player on the team and he was like, you know, you're number two, you know, I need you to, to go out there and, and score and be my number two. And, and he made sure every night that I was, that I was prepared and ready to play. So I owe a lot to Charles.
was it like, truthfully, playing against Charles Barkley? The one moment that I can pick where Charles, uh, we were playing Philly in the playoffs. And I guess I got into a hot rhythm and I had about 40 some points. Years. Does what he just did to rookies and veterans alike. And Michael Jordan, he's playing against a guy who is a great rebounder. His job is not right. And B.J. Armstrong, the five for Chicago. But Charles is yelling. I can hear him yelling in the huddle. So I'm, who's going to guard this guy? Somebody's got to guard this guy. That's all right. I guard this guy. Jordan. And a matchup. Charles Barkley defending Jordan. So I go in and we're playing and, and we got into a switch. And Charles jumps out and guards me. And yeah, I never known Charles as a, as a defensive <laughs> stopper. So the first thing he does, he breaks down in this defensive position with hands up. All, everything looks technically, technically right. And I just laugh. I say, when in the hell are you going to start playing defense? <laughs> and who taught you how to get in a defensive stance? And I had to pass it. But that's the type of guy he would take on a challenge, even though, even though he was not up to the challenge. He didn't care. And that's just him. What would, give me an example, Charles, what you would say. What, what, what one of the guys would no, say? No, what you would say. When you talk to I'll friends. tell you what he oh, said. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing him in uh, Washington. And, uh, I'm playing him in Washington. And, I, and um, he's a little older. I think, uh, you know, it was, it was maybe four more years in his career, but, you know, and uh, I, I follow him. And I get, you know, get away with it, come back down. And uh, the next time, uh, you know, he's going off at the ref. He followed me, he followed me. And, and uh, I'm like, I ain't following him. He, he over there crying. And the ref, he's like, uh, he looked at the ref, he's like, I scored 24,000 points or something. I scored 20,000 points right here in this position. You gonna tell me he ain't following me? And the ref just shook. <laughs> and I, knew, I knew I was in trouble. I was like, this ref, you know. The ref was intimidated by his talk. But a lot of guys, like you said, it's just, it's not it's malicious. Just it's just what you're doing. Hey, hey, hey. I just hated when a guy thought he could guard me, to be honest with you. I'm like, dude, please, just, uh, just work hard, but you can't stop me. <laughs> Is there any way to, to foretell a 56-point night? No, no. What, did he get 56 or something like that against the Warriors in one series? And it's just what he did. He could do that. Because he could do stuff like that, sometimes, you know, you let him be a minute late to the bus. We are underway. Game three in Oakland. A victory by the Suns and the season ends for Golden State. A Warrior win and they stay alive in the play on Friday. Barkley from 15. Swish, it's good. The game against C. Webb and those guys was just revenge. That was, that was by Byron Houston. We told Coach, don't let did. Byron Houston check the chat. <laughs> like, no, he's strong. He's like, he's six foot one. Don't let him check, don't let him check Big Chuck. That game was so funny Byron. because I, I remember. Yeah, Byron Houston. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, no, and I remember I, I went to the bench. Well, I remember going to the uh, Warriors bench. And I'm talking to Don Nelson. I said, Don. I got like 10 points in the first three, four minutes of the game. He says, we're not going to double you. You're not going to double me? He says, nope. Because I had a triple-double. I think that was game three. So I had a, a triple-double I had a triple -double game one. I had about uh, eight assists in game two. So Nelly says, we're not going to double you tonight. I says, you're not? You got a guy named Don Nelson saying no one, he doesn't need to double-team Charles. And he said, if you can beat us, beat us. And we still laugh about that story to this day. Out to Barkley, fake the three, wants to shoot it again, got it. What a first quarter for Sir Charles. So I score like 27 points, did not miss a shot, 11 for 11 from the field, three three-pointers. So I run over again. I said, let me ask you, you're not going to double me. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you can get as many as you want. I said, okay. <laughs> I actually personally think game seven to get to the finals is the best game I ever played. Okay, we lose game six in Seattle. So I called Frank Johnson, who's one of my good friends on the team, back to the plane. I said, Frank, I need to talk to you in the back. I said, Frank, what's, what can I do to get this team pumped up for game seven? He says to me, we're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. We're going to find. We're going to win game seven. I says, how do you know that? He says, you've never been to the finals. you never been to the finals, right? I said, no. He says, you just got to play the best basketball game of your life. And he said, we'll follow. I says, really? That's a good, interesting point. And I said, um, 
<laughs> okay, but I said, I got to get the rest of the team. He said, just go and just BS with them. Just make them laugh, have fun with them. But all the pressure's on your back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he said, you, you won MVP. You never been to the finals. You got game seven at home. You just got to play the best basketball game you ever played. Probably just won't be denied. And Grant has been caught by Barkley. Here's Charles. Lambo! There's Charles with a steal and a wham, bam, slam. Game sevens are no joke. Did, did it feel different than any other game? Oh, when, yeah. When, oh, first when, of all, when game you sevens. Him, when, oh, yeah, but when he tells you, look, not only do we have a game seven, you have to have the best game of your life. I, I, first of all, as a star, you always feel pressure because the one thing about a star, you're going to get the blame. So you automatically feel that pressure. I mean, nobody's going to say uh, <laughs> Sid Sabalos didn't win the championship. They said Charles Barkley didn't win the championship. Right. So I knew, I knew that from my days in Philly. That was my first year in Phoenix. I got MVP. And so I was ready for the game, but I was trying to just get the team. I said, guys, let's go. We're good. When we need him the most, uh, he came through. So. To have a game like that in Game 7, to propel us to the championship, to have 44 points and 24, I mean, and like I said, you're talking about a guy who's 6'4", 6'5". I mean, it's just amazing, just shows you what type of player he is and how great a player he was. In games like that, I mean, don't even try and go get a rebound. <laughs> I mean, don't even try and go get a rebound because he's going to knock you down and throw his, you know, you probably get elbowed by Charles. It sounds crazy to say it, but when Charles did stuff like that, it didn't even surprise me. <laughs> the guy had that gear that he would do whatever he had to do. And the tougher it was, the better he was. The fact that Charles in that particular game rose to the occasion and put the, the nail in the coffin, that's about as monster a game as you possibly could have. It's over, the Suns win, the Suns win. They're the Western Conference champion. And they move on to play the defending world champion Chicago Bulls for all the marbles. Pretty good. It's just their numbers. It's, it's a very, very <laughs> lukewarm, yeah. very lukewarm reaction yeah. from, That's a from Shaq. 24, 24, yeah. But, <laughs> so, so, so. Could you take down Shaq now? Come on, man. You ever seen a guy fight? Lakers are trying to get out and, and, and break now, but the wrong people are shooting. I, I wouldn't want Fisher necessarily to take down Shaq that fast. Uh oh. Oh, and there's a swing by O'Neal. And they've got a blue ha ha. A real fighter throws the first punch. I'm not gonna walk up to you and let y'all slug me in my jaw first. I got to get y'all first. Oh, I'm a real fighter. Right? Yeah. 1999. Let's about a real fighter. Fight. Chuck. Uh, All I want to know. Wait, wait. We said, what you what? say? The winning, oh, winning guy is the winner. Well, the guy on the top is the winner. No, bro. I'm yeah, on I'm top. <laughs> Shaq. Yeah, no. You ever see him win a fight? <laughs> Shaq can't fight a lick. I hit him in that big old gut. He, he, <laughs> Because I can't, I can't reach his you big old get... head. So I hit him in the gut, and that gut, and then it'll bring him down. And then when he come down, I clock him. This is what happened. You can slow down if you want to. I wanted to show the left to my man, so when he went for the left, I wanted to hit him with the right, but somebody grabbed me. But when he got me down on the ground, he didn't do nothing, so I know we wasn't even really sick. But check this out. After that fight, we both got in trouble. I love this angle over me right here, Shaq. I love this angle. Yeah. Like this. See, the, she, the left. Hey, you know what I'm saying? And number five, hold me. Hold me. Hold me. Get him, Tino. Tino, hit him. Look at this. The left. See? Oh. See, see how I just showed him? See? That's called see? Bobby Weezy. That was just a little Ali. You know, some people, like, jump all out the way. I just, like, subtle. Subtle. Let's do it in slow motion. How was that? Oh. You know what's funny about that? <clears throat> what? A lot of people don't know that Charles' mother and my mother were best friends. Oh, yeah. So the day me and Charles got into an altercation, the phone rings. It was an Alabama number. And his mom, don't you put your hands on my baby. You need to stop fussing at each other and get a grip and behave. <laughs> and then my mom called, what y'all doing out there fights? Pretty good way to go out, winning a gold medal and playing with, well, I can't say the best team ever assembled, but one of the best teams ever assembled. Um, <laughs> the, the cast of characters, the different personalities than Charles Barkley. Uh, but um, we had a lot of fun. He was definitely our MVP during that Olympic run. And still today, you sit there and watch him and say, how did a man his size be able to do the things that he did? Charles was the life of Barcelona. Only Charles could have 5,000 people following him all over the place. He would go out and talk to people who were pretty unfortunate. 
And I remember one homeless woman who never asked him for anything. He just one day stuck a wad of bills in a bag. Best of times was Charles rolling down the rhombus. The worst of times is when he would elbow an Angolan. You know, everybody that has ever been in front of a camera, we tend to not say certain things. Why don't they just take their ass whipping like people and go home? <laughs> Barkley says things that we would think about and never say. We're going to have a li little revenge in our hearts for 72 and 88. David, well, he can't say that because he's a Christian. But uh... <laughs> he said, man, you don't talk honestly enough to the media. You need to tell them what you're really thinking. I said, Charles, you talk too much to the media. And you need to stop telling them everything you're thinking. And when Charles was asked about the team's first opponent, his prediction was as honest as ever. I don't know anything about Angola, but Angola's in trouble, I think. Charles found some trouble. I had the players in Angola, the play against South Barclay, they told us there's no a, a, a kid, a fat boy, is a, is many aggressive in the pain. I thought they were playing dirty, and, uh, and I told old boy, I don't, I don't even know if he understood him. I said, hey, man, ease up on the elbow. Barkley from Pippen. I let it go twice. You can see the frustration with Barkley. And the next time, I just cracked it. Barkley from Pippen. And a technical foul has been called. I thought, what are you doing, Charles? <laughs> the guy is half your size. But you know, Charles was an equal opportunity abuser. That's the same guy that just asked for an autograph, Charles. I mean, you think he's not intimidated? I think he's at like a bullying. But maybe it's, uh, it's from his personality. They were throwing elbows as well. So Charles being a competitor, he's going to throw an elbow back. I asked him whether that was in keeping with the Olympic ideal. And he said, hey, it's the ideal of the playground. This is the way you play. I said to Michael, I said, Michael, why don't you have a talk with Charles? You know, get him calmed down a little bit. He said, we've tried, it's your turn. Wilkes with the elbow. Well, he hit me, I hit him, that's the way it is. Charles made you look like the ugly Americans, which we were trying not to do. We said to Charles, look, man, you're a reflection of all of us. So if you do it, they're not going to write the article that Charles Barkley did. They're going to say the dream team. Everybody always had the same question. How much of a, an ass is Charles Barkley? Hey, Jack, when am I going to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated for this stuff? I should be on the dream team cover. And then every time you'd go spend time with him, you know, you'd just realize that he was the most enjoyable act not only in all of sports, but possibly in all of pop culture. Sometimes I dream that he is me. I just want to be like Chuck, I mean Mike. So Barkley strolled Los Ramos, a man of the people, if ever there was one. Man, I walked up and down the Ramos every night, and the people were fantastic. They all wanted autographs and wanted to take pictures. We could be inside the hotel. Soon we heard the big roar. We said, there go Charles. <laughs> so Charles would be walking, and then thousands would be following him everywhere he went, you know? He was the Pied Piper. Charles would go over to the village and, like, find the Angolan players and hang out along the Ramblocks at night. He was the most memorable person of the 1992 Olympics. Because Ernie has all the notes. And he has everything in order. And, I, and Charles is new. Well, we can do in a game break. And he's like, what's those? I'm like, those are his notes. He just keeps them there to make sure everything's it's in order. It's the format for the post-game show with a couple of notes written in yeah, it. I so said, we're going to go from here to here to here to here to here. And I realized he didn't know what it was and how important it was. And I, and I egged him. I said, I bet you want to take those from uh, Ernie. And, he, and he's like, I won't even take them. I'll rip them up. And so now I go, oh, he definitely don't know how important these are. And so now Ernie hears us. He says, Charles, don't play. Don't even think about <laughs> don't it. Don't think about it. This is, don't, don't do it. So I was like, oh, you're not going to really, re I thought he was going to do one of these. Yeah. <laughs> then fake it. 
So Charles takes it and he rips it up, right? He was mad. Oh, no, wait. You know, Ernie, Ernie, God bless, is the most Christian man I know. That shit wasn't funny. <laughs> and he didn't speak to us the rest of the show. And the first time he was, I was scared. I was like, Ernie's not, might swing on me. Cause he was like, you started it. Cause you gave him the notes. I was like, I started doing this. And so I just froze him out of the next segment. Oh, you know, we came back, yeah, yeah. Cause I was ready to, I, I was ready. I had a cup of coffee. I was ready to throw a cup of coffee. In I was, I was, I was, hot. I heard I curse, was hot, man. Ever. Cause internally I was just crying. Yeah. Cause I had never heard him curse. I won't ever do that again. No, 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 that, no, no. You know, because you know what that did to me in that moment? It was that these guys don't respect what I do. That's what that said to me. I've been working on this, sh you know, on this show. <laughs> no, I'm, no, no, I've been working on this show. <laughs> no, you call yourself the MVP of the start of the league. Uh, you know, every player that sat here, that's sitting here, that was considered that, have done that. Every player that, you know, in the past have done that. <laughs> yo, what time out? <laughs> Fuck, man, yo, you gotta get this dude some dojo over here. Yeah, I was trying to get you some dojo over here. He's like, he's tired, man. He's called the itis, baby. Yeah, this is called the itis. This was. He got the itis. He got the itis. This was moments ago. Um, oh, this dude's got the itis. We were having our discussion on LeBron James. And, Charles, what's going on here? I'm tired, man. <laughs> Whoops. Um, he, he, uh, <laughs> nice, hey, how's your manicure, Chuck? Oh, watch the lens. <laughs> watch the lens. <laughs> he about to wake up and agree with you, though. He about to wake up and agree. Watch this. He's like, uh, <laughs> 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 I didn't even know what was going on. And if you made it all the way through, shout out to you. If you enjoyed it, please help me out by hitting that like button, subscribe if you are new, and hit that notification button to stay up to date with all the new episodes in this series. If you would like to comment down an NBA player next, feel free to do so, and I'll catch you guys in my next episode. Here are two videos you might enjoy. With that said, I am out. Peace.